Hello children, welcome to our Shakespearean themed episode of Brain Food. William Shakespeare was an English poet, playwright, and actor, and is widely regarded as the greatest writer in the history of the English language. His use of language actually helped shape modern English, and many common phrases that you might hear today were his inventions. For example, have you ever heard of the phrase, beware the Ides of March? This expression was first found in the Shakespeare play Julius Caesar, which he wrote in 1601. The line is spoken to warn Julius Caesar of his impending death. The concept of Ides was taken from the Roman calendar, which calculated the Ides to be either the 15th or 13th of each month. Simply put, beware the Ides of March means beware the 15th of March. Hey guys, it's me, Sky. This month on Brain Food, we're celebrating William Shakespeare and his influence on theatrical culture in today's world. You can find many different community theaters all over Polk County, and today I'm at the Lake Wales Little Theater to talk to Leslie Grondon about the magic of stage production. Hi Leslie, so how are you involved with the Lake Wales Little Theater? Well currently right now I am the president and have been for the last three years. I also do a lot of volunteering here, backstage, act on stage. I also do a lot of um, publicity for the theater as well as um, our Facebook page and all the fun stuff we do here with the kids. How long have you been a part of the Lake Wales Little Theater? Well, that's a, a little tricky question there. I started when I was six years old in the 1980s and then I left and came back and I have been back for the last 10 years. What is the Lake Wales Little Theater? The Lake Wales Little Theater is a, a great community theater where people can come out to try out acting, come and see great little plays, as well as uh, learn how to do some skills, maybe building, um, volunteering, getting to know a lot of people. It's a great community theater. Anybody can get involved. You can start as little as um, like in t second grade, second and third grade, you can start in plays all the way up to you can be 100 years old just as long as you enjoy being in the theater and working here. What kinds of plays can people see here? Well, there's quite a variety. We have children's plays that we do every year. We have teen plays that we do at the end of our season. And we do um, adult plays, a lot of comedy. We're doing musicals. And then we do a little bit of drama plays, too. Can you describe all the planning and preparation it takes to present a play on stage? Yes, we first start out whenever the, before the season starts actually reading all the scripts and figuring out what would be best for our community and picking those plays. And once we pick those plays, then we find our directors. And then from the directors, we find actors when we do tryouts. And then we have backstage, which is set building. So we build almost every Saturday. And we also do um, lighting and sound, getting that together, pick out props, costumes, and painting. Wow, that's a lot of work for just one play. Do you guys have any shows that are just for kids? Yes, we do. We start that at the beginning of our season. Usually we have the tryouts for those right before school starts each year, and the play runs usually in September. What if I'm too shy to be on stage? Are there any other ways for me to get involved? Well, of course, there's plenty of things that you can do at the theater. If you want to work backstage, we can always get you working backstage, helping put the props on the stage during the show when the lights are down, or you can help paint, make props, anything that you're interested in, we can get you doing. You don't have to be on stage at all. What do you think is the most fun part of participating in a theater production? The most fun part is the people. It is great to get to know different people in your small town because you never know who you run into and you create great friendships. Thank you so much, Leslie. I think I'm going to convince my mom and dad to let me try out for an upcoming show. Oh, I'll be glad to see you. I'll see you guys next time. Bye! We're here today at Exploration 5 Children's Museum in downtown Lakeland for this segment of Senses Overdrive. This is Tia. She's going to be helping us with our experiment. So, Tia, what are we going to be doing today? Well, hi everyone. So, here at Explorations 5 in the month of February, we're focusing on I Heart You. So, our experiment today is about one of our programs called Curious Kids 
um, and we're actually going to be looking at an ooey gooey heart. Um, so before we get into that, I just wanted to say um, a couple of different things. One is that, you know, hearts are about emotions. It's really important that we teach our kids about how to express their emotions and what they look like. So that's part of what we're going to be doing here at the museum this month. And it's also about just learning about our hearts. What, um, what they look like, what do they sound like, um, can we see how fast they're beating, what makes them beat faster. Um, and so we have fun things planned and we even have an exhibit downstairs where you can actually check your heart rate and listen to your heart. Um, but today we're focusing on some ooey gooey science. Okay. So right here we have some fun gelatin molds and they're okay. like super jiggly and it's cold and they're in the shape of a heart. Um, and we're going to use pipettes okay. and we're going to suck up some food coloring and we just have, we have red and we have blue because when we look inside at our veins, our blood is actually blue, right? Huh. You kind of can see that. Um, so we're going to put the blue in one side and then when um, our blood gets oxygen, it turns red, right? So we got some fun red and what happens when the colors mix? They make purple. Of course. So let's go ahead and try it out, see what happens. So the blue first? Blue first. Okay. And there's actually no right or wrong way. We're just going to stab our gelatin mold and squirt it in. And that's it. Okay. And then you just keep going and you're, eventually we're going to just dye fun little streaks of color. It's going to replace some of the gelatin with some color streaks. And what do you notice that's happening with the, the dye when we put it in there? They're spreading. It's spreading slowly, right? So, and the fun things that kids really like to do is they like to experiment and they like to see, hmm, what happens if I push out the liquid super fast? Oh, it just squirts all over the place, right? Yeah. And then what happens if we just go really slowly? What's the difference? Like, what's it just that? falls. Yeah. So, it's a fun little experiment. The kids really love it. Um, and. We're really excited to experiment with it some more. <laughs> it just exploded everywhere. That's part of the fun, right? And it's a super fun, messy one. And <laughs> who doesn't love messy science, right? Exactly. So what's actually happening is the consistency of the food coloring and the consistency of the jello um, or gelatin just happens to be that the gelatin itself kind of spreads around in there, but mostly it stays still, kind of like a vacuum. And that's sort of, I don't know if you can see it in there, but see it just kind of stays where you puncture it. Hmm. So it gets stuck. Wow, thanks Tia, that was fun. If you want to get your senses into overdrive, come here to Exploration 5 Children's Museum in downtown Lakeland. Bye everyone, I'll see you again soon. Bye. term of the day is scuffle. The word scuffle can be used as a verb or a noun and it means a short confused fight or struggle that's not very serious. For example, the children scuffled on the playground or the children got into a scuffle on the playground. This word was invented by Shakespeare for his play The Tragedy of Antony and Cleopatra. <laughs> Are you ready to play Where's Ed App? The game show quiz that takes you around the world. Well, way back in the year 1600 AD, the famous playwriter William Shakespeare wrote the play Julius Caesar. Many of Shakespeare's plays took place in real world locations. So today, we're gonna see if you can guess what some of those places are. Let's get started with question number one. In the play Julius Caesar by William Shakespeare, much of the action takes place in the city of Rome. At one point, the city of Rome spread to become a great empire that stretched across a lot of land. Now the city of Rome is the capital of this country and is about the size of New York City with a population of 2.8 million people. Is Rome located in A, Poland, B, Iran or C, Italy. It's C. That's right.
right, Rome is the capital city of Italy. Italy is easy to pick out on the map because it looks like a giant boot. Italy is also known for its unique food that features pastas, many savory spices, and olive oil. The city of Rome is also unique because it's the only city in the world that actually has a country inside its boundaries. Vatican City, which is the headquarters for the Roman Catholic Church, is actually considered its own country. So technically, it's a country inside the city of Rome, which is inside the country of Italy. Okay, on to question number two. William Shakespeare wrote another play around 1600 AD called Hamlet. This story took place in a country located in the northern part of the continent of Europe. This country is considered a peninsula because it is surrounded by water on three sides. It is also made up of hundreds of little islands. Its capital city is called Copenhagen and its population of 5.7 million people is considered to be the happiest people in the world. Is this country A, Ecuador, B, Denmark, or C, Indonesia? It's B, Denmark. The story of Hamlet is actually called The Tragedy of Hamlet, Prince of Denmark. The story is that Prince Hamlet's father, King Hamlet, had a brother Claudius, and Claudius murdered King Hamlet so that he could become King of Denmark. But the ghost of King Hamlet returns to instruct his son Hamlet to get revenge. As the story of Hamlet suggests, there has been a king or queen in rule of Denmark for a very long time. The current family has been in charge for more than 1,000 years making it the longest running monarchy in the world. Well, now you know a little more about Italy and Denmark, two of the countries in Shakespeare's plays. That's all for this episode of Where's That At? Thanks for playing, I'll see you next time. And welcome to Storytime. Now, some people avoid the work of William Shakespeare because they feel that since it was written so long ago, it's not relevant or doesn't make any sense today. Well, you and I are going to go through one of his poems together. And if you're patient, I think you'll be surprised. When in disgrace from fortune and men's eyes, I alone beweep my outcast state, and trouble deaf heaven with my bootless cries and look upon myself, curse my fate. Wishing me like to one more rich in hope, featured like him or like him with friends possessed, desiring this man's art and that man's scope, with what I enjoy most, contented least. Yet in these thoughts, myself almost despising, Happily, I think on thee, and then my state, like to the lark at break of day arising, from sullen earth sings hymns at heaven's gate. For thy sweet love remembered, such wealth brings, that then I scorn to change my state with kings. Now then, what does all of that mean? when in disgrace from fortune and men's eyes, when I have no luck and people don't like me, I alone beweep my outcast state. I cry because no one wants to be around me and trouble deaf heaven with my bootless cries and I pray but I get no answer, look upon myself and curse my fate. And I feel sorry for myself. Wishing me like to one more rich in hope, I wish I was someone who had hope. Featured like him, or like him with friends possessed. And looked like him, or had his friends. Desiring this man's art and that man's scope. Or had his skills, or his freedom. With what I enjoy most, contented least. When I'm not happy with what I used to enjoy most, Yet in these thoughts, myself almost despising, 
and feel depressed and almost hate myself, happily I think on thee, and then my state I remember you, and by thinking of you my depression, like to the lark at break of day arising, rises like a bird at dawn, from sullen earth sings hymns at heaven's gate. I leave the ground and sing to heaven for thy sweet love remembered, such wealth brings. Because knowing that you care about me makes me so happy that then I scorn to change my state with kings, that I wouldn't even trade places with a king. <laughs> so this poem is about someone who's having a tough time and feeling a little bit sorry for themselves. And then they remember that there's someone in their life who cares about them. And that reminds them that they're lucky. And that makes them feel better. I can relate to that. How about you? Thank you for joining us for story time. Are you ready for another Shakespeare invented word? Multitudinous is an adjective that simply means very many. It's a highly expressive word that you can use when you just want a better description than multiple, numerous, or a lot. For example, my life has changed in multitudinous ways. Or, you are asking me a multitude of questions. Please stop. The word multitudinous first showed up in Shakespeare's play Macbeth. Hey kids, it's me, Steve, and we're here for another episode of Power Up. Today, I'm here with Nigel to learn about fencing. So Nigel, what is fencing? Uh, fencing is a sport that is uh, derived from uh, the art of swordsmanship. Uh, it's in particular uh, a European derived sport. The sport um, was, uh, of fencing was invented by the French. So the language, the official language of fencing is French. Oh, I shall hit you with my sword. The weapon that we use here uh, mostly is the foil. There are three weapons okay. in, the, um, in the sport. The one that people would recognize most, of course, these are not actually weapons, is the saber. And if you, uh, you know, see cavalry movies and the curved weapon, this one's not curved, it's straight, uh, just for the sport, but the curved weapon that would be used from horseback that was derived from uh, the Middle Eastern uh, scimitar. The epe was developed in the 19th century and it is only a point weapon. And it was developed for the sake of dueling. Then the, the foil, which is the lightest of the weapon, was developed from something called the small sword. So is, would the foil be the one Zorro used? Not at all. Zorro probably used, what was that you think, a rapier? Rapier. rapier. Yeah. Now these obviously aren't going to hurt you. Badly. <laughs> let's, let's rewind. Let's fencing, rewind. Fencing is a very safe sport. They yeah. did a, a, a short st the study in the 2012 Olympics, and fencing actually had fewer injuries than badminton. Okay. <laughs> These swords are designed to be safe. Uh, yes, they are. The, as you can see, they're very flexible, even though they're made of steel, mm -hmm. right? So when you hit the target properly, they bend, and uh, there's a lot of safety gear that's worn. So Nigel, if these things don't draw first blood, how do you know if you've scored? Is there some special way these swords work? So if you look at this one, it has a little button oh, yeah, on the end, yep. right? And then it has a plug here, and you will see that later, where you plug the scoring machine, and then there's a target area for the foil, right? which makes it a little bit different from the other weapons. And what does that look like, the target area? Well, we have a lovely model. So this silver garment is, uh, is conductive, and it is called the lame. The uh, 
target area for foil is only the torso front and back. Nigel, how long does it take to get good at fencing? About three minutes. <laughs> no. Um, well, it depends. So fencing for me is not a very natural sport. And uh, I work really hard at it. It took, probably took me a good 10 years before I thought, oh, you know, I'm not too bad. But then you have people that come in and they're just naturals at it. Yeah. So is fencing a good exercise? Yes. So despite the fact that I'm a little tubby, uh, it's because I don't fence enough. <laughs> but uh, it, it is both a very mental sport and of course it's a sport, so it's very physical yeah. as well. So it's a very good exercise. Well, that's great. I can't wait to see you guys in action. Well, <laughs> I can't wait either. Let's get to it. That was a whole lot of fun. I think I would love to get started fencing. Thanks for joining us for this episode of Power Up. for our last term of the day. The word consanguineous is an adjective which describes people who are from the same biological family. For example, the boy felt just as close to his adopted brother as he did to his consanguineous siblings. This term was first used in Shakespeare's comedy Twelfth Night. Well, I hope that you've enjoyed learning a little bit about William Shakespeare and how his mind and words influence the English language. Thank you for watching and I'll see you next time for more terminology. Hey kids, welcome to this edition of Arts and Crafts. During today's episode, we're learning about the most famous playwright in the world, William Shakespeare. Shakespeare was born on April 26, 1564 in a place called Stratford-upon-Avon in England. He had seven brothers and sisters. Not much is known about his childhood, but historians guess that he didn't attend school beyond the eighth grade because it was considered a luxury at that time. After getting married and having children, Shakespeare's works began appearing on stage in London at the Globe Theatre. He wrote at least 37 plays, two volumes of poetry, and 150 sonnets. He introduced almost 3,000 original words to the English language which are still used today. He's also responsible for famous phrases such as green-eyed monster, good riddance, to be or not to be, wild goose chase, and off with his head among countless others. He even created the knock-knock joke. The phrase knock-knock who's there was first found in his play Macbeth. Now that you've learned a little bit about William Shakespeare, it's time for our craft of the day. I'm going to teach you how to make your very own crown. So when you put on plays and act out scenes, you can wear this and feel like a king or a queen. For this craft, you will need yellow or gold construction paper, black construction paper, scissors, glue, a ruler, a single hole puncher, a paper fastener, and little jewels, sequins, beads, or other decorations for your crown. First, cut out a two inch wide strip of yellow or gold construction paper long enough to go around your head. This piece will be the crown's base. Glue the ends of the strip together to form a circle.
cut out two strips of black construction paper that are one and a half inches wide by 10 inches long. Glue the first strip across the middle section of the base. Position the second strip perpendicular to the first strip. Try to make sure the both strips are at the same height. Glue the ends in place. Cut out six strips of yellow or gold construction paper. Each strip should be one and a half inches wide and eight inches long. Next, cut out a curved end on one side of each strip. Then, punch a hole near the tip of each strip. Glue each of your yellow or gold strips inside the base of your crown so that they're evenly spaced out. Try to glue them all at the same height along the base. Now we're going to make a cross-shaped topper for our crown. Cut out two identical crosses from yellow or gold construction paper. Each cross should have a rectangular tab at the bottom. Cut them out and glue the crosses together without gluing the tabs at the bottom. Fold out the bottom tabs and punch a hole at the center of one of them. Now, punch a hole in the middle of the black strips on your crown. Insert your round paper fastener here. Take all of the strips and tuck them neatly under the cross. Then insert the paper fastener through the center hole of the crown. Turn your crown upside down and split the ends of the fastener. Now the structure of your crown is done! Decorate with sequins, rhinestones, beads, or plastic jewels. Wait for the crown to dry and then try it on. Today's craft was inspired by a quote from the Shakespeare play, Henry VI. My crown is in my heart, not on my head. Not decked with diamonds and Indian stones, nor to be seen. My crown is called content, a crown it is that kings seldom enjoy. Well, thank you so much for joining me, and I hope that this episode inspires you to learn more about Shakespeare. I'll see you next time for more arts and crafts.